Founder Bishop Paul S. and co-founder Dr. Deborah B. Morton, Bishop T. Delbert, and co-pastor Jasmine M. Robinson, and Pastor Robert and First Lady Sharita Maxwell invite you to worship with us in Atlanta at Changing the Generation, Sundays at 9 a.m. and Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time at 923 Valley Brook Road, Decatur. That's New Beginning Full Gospel Baptist Church Sanctuary. Or worship with us in New Orleans at Greater St. Stephen, Sundays at 10.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Central Time. Stream with us on Facebook Live, YouTube, Apple TV, and Roku. It's you and the Greater Change family. Unique blend of ministry. One church in two states. Coming up on Greater Change Ministry. Here's the reality. I don't need somebody that knows about as much as what I know about the situation. I need somebody that knows what I don't know. I, I need somebody whose knowledge is superior. I need somebody whose ability is greater than what I have. And that's the good thing about our God. We have an invitation in the text that says, when you don't know what to do, when you don't have it all figured out, when you are at your end, come to me. I am the God that knows what you don't know. And because he doesn't know what we know because he knows what we don't know rather he is able to give us wisdom according to what his infinite knowledge his knowledge is without bounds his knowledge is infinite be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God from Changing a Generation Full Gospel Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, and Greater St. Stephen Full Gospel Baptist Church in New Orleans, Louisiana, one church in two states. Founder, Bishop Paul S. and co-founder, Dr. Deborah B. Morton, Bishop T. Delbert, and co-pastor-elect, Jasmine M. Robinson, and campus pastor, Robert, and First Lady, Sharita Maxwell. Welcome you to the Greater Change Outreach Ministry. When will it Will things get better than Now prepare for a life changing experience. I can already feel Well, praise the Lord and God bless you. Welcome to the Greater Change Telecast. I am Bishop T. Delbert Robinson, and today I am so excited, you don't even understand, the one, the only Bishop Paul S. Morton. He's here with us right now. Listen, I am so excited, Bishop T. Delbert Robinson, my son-in-law. I love him, I thank God for him, and on this side, my nephew, Yes, my nephew beloved, Pastor Robert Maxwell, Greater St. Stephen, changing a generation, one church, two states. And guess what? They got some preaching wives too. My firstborn, yes. co-pastor, Jasmine Morton Robinson. And you better look out. Ooh, the woman of God, our first lady at changing a generation, the one and only. Elder Sharita Maxwell. Listen, this is the dream team, y'all. I mean, it's like a dream come true when you see your legacy continuing to go forth. I am just so excited. I am, of course, the founder of Changing a Generation along with co founder Deborah B. Morton. And of course, I'm the overseer at Greater St. Stephen because. Greater St. Stephen started 87 years ago, so y'all know I ain't 87. I know I'm getting old, but I'm not 87. Listen, I am grateful. We're gonna hear from Pastor Robert Maxwell, the new pastor of Changing a Generation. Bishop, thank you so much. We thank God for our founder. We thank God for Bishop Robinson. Isn't it amazing to be a part of this amazing dream team? I'm just excited about all that God is going to do through the Greater Change family. We are doing a new thing, and man, you haven't seen anything yet. We're taking it to the next level. The word is going to be elevate. We're going to the next level. Look out for us. We're excited about it, and we thank God for what he's doing. Bishop Robinson. Listen. This is so exciting. I know you can feel it translating across the airwaves. We got Decatur, New Orleans, the founder, 
our wives, you don't want to miss out on what God is about to do. Just to get a preview of it, just to get a little bit of what's about to take place. We're getting ready now to go into the sanctuary. Today, we're going to get right into the word of the Lord today. If you will partner with me, we're going to go to the gospel according to Mark, the fifth chapter. And we'll begin reading at the 25th verse, and it reads, A woman in the crowd had suffered from a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much suffering at the hands of many physicians. She had spent all that she had had and was not helped at all, but instead had become worse. She had heard reports about Jesus, and she had come up behind him in the crowd and touched his outer robe. For she thought, if I just touch his clothing, I will get well. Immediately, her flow of blood was dried up, and she felt in her body and knew without any doubt that she was healed of her suffering. Immediately, Jesus, recognizing in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in around you from all sides, and you ask, who touched me? Still, he kept looking around to see the woman who had done it. And the woman, though she was afraid and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith, your personal trust and confidence in me has restored you to health. Go in peace and be permanently healed from your suffering. For our time together, we're going to talk and teach from this subject, Jesus Christ, the answer and the solution. The context of our story takes place in in the gospel according to Mark chapter five, shortly after Jesus has cast out the legion of demons from the man known in in the region known as the Gerasenes. And it's a familiar story where when Jesus went over there, the demons begged him to cast them into the pigs. He does. And then the people, after he does it, the people beg him to leave their coast because likely they lost income from the pigs. So in verse 17 of our text, we see that happen. He and his disciples get into a boat and then they cross back over to the other side of of the lake, returning to Capernaum where they had been in the first place. Now, as soon as they arrive, they are greeted by a large crowd of people eager to receive them. Among the crowd is one of the synagogue leaders, Jairus, whose daughter is at home sick to the point of death. He begs Jesus, come and heal my baby, and Jesus obliges him. And with Jairus leading the way, Jesus and this crowd are headed to perform this miracle for this synagogue ruler. Now, sandwiched between Jairus' request for Jesus to come to his home and Jesus raising this young lady from the dead, we will find a narrative concerning this woman with an issue of blood. Now, I like to call her personally the scene stealer because this moment was not about her. It wasn't her turn. Jesus was on his way to somebody else's house to perform a miracle for someone else when this woman comes on to the scene. Now, we don't even get a name for this woman, but instead she is identified by the issue with which she is struggling. Side note, isn't it interesting how people can't remember your name, but they can certainly remember your struggle. They can certainly identify you by what is going on. You, you, you know how to, yeah, that's, that's, that's Sarah with the bad kids. You know, that's Lion Larry. You, that's dysfunctional Diane. We, we, we always seem to be able to identify people with something. You, and y'all know in our community, we will take it even further. You know, that's such and such. You know, she got the cock out. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Why do we do that? The truth is, we readily identify people by their struggle. But thank God that God is not like man. And he sees beyond what we're struggling with to our greater purpose. Now, we all know the story of this woman. She had a constant issue of blood upon her for 12 years. This issue had thrown her into great weakness. It had messed with the comfort of her life. It was ultimately threatening to be her demise in but a little while. And because of this constant bleeding, according to Levitical law, she was considered ceremonially unclean. That means she was excluded from everyday happenings because here's the thing. 
she was not only unclean, but anybody that she came into contact with would be declared unclean. So can you imagine what this has done to her socially? Can you imagine what this has done to her mentally? She has lived most of this time in isolation from people, avoiding contact, avoiding hugs, no, no hugs, no friendly gestures, no welcoming greetings, none of the above. When people saw her, they were offended by her simply because of what she was struggling with. Here's the thing. She had had the best advice of physicians that she could get she made use of the medicines and all the methods they prescribed, and she still didn't get better. And after spending all of her money, these same physicians give her up as incurable, right? Our text doesn't tell us how she knew that Jesus was passing by. Perhaps she had heard of the recent uproar in the Gerasenes and knew that this same Jesus that had expelled the demons from this man was passing by, and she thought to herself, maybe, just maybe, he is able to do something in my life but whatever it was she had concluded that Jesus alone was the answer she had tried everything else and everything else had failed her and now she knew that she needed to get to Jesus this was this reckoning that listen I'm not a hater listen brother Jairus I, I, I'm not trying to stop Jesus from coming to your baby I, I know that's important but listen I need to make a connection with the one that I believe can do something about my situation I, I, I'm not trying to stop you from getting your blessing but I need a blessing and I need a blessing now have you ever been so desperate for a touch from God that it didn't matter. You said, listen, I'm not coming to church to see what you got on. I'm not coming to church to see what song the choir is singing, but instead I'm coming to church because I need a touch from the one that can cure me from what's going on in my life. I'm not worried about you. I need a touch from heaven and I need it right now. Is there anybody here that's ever needed him just that bad? Many of us can identify with her urgency. She has an urgent need. She needs to get to Jesus. And so there are just a few items from the text that I want to lift up and highlight to identify the efficacy of Christ as our answer and solution. So let's press into the text real quick. First thing that we will note in the text, the first thing we will note is God-sized problems require God. That's number one. God-sized problems require God. We talked about that a little bit before, but a God-sized problem is a problem that exceeds the abilities and capacities of the men, women, structures, and systems that are around them. In other words, the scope of the problem is so wide. The scope of the problem is so high. The scope of the problem is so deep and so vast that it exceeds the capacity of humanity. Man can't do nothing about it. That's just a dramatic way of saying man can't do nothing about it. The requisite solution for a God-sized problem inevitably requires that God, who is superior in ability and capacity, get involved and visit the situation with the ability that only he has. This woman has been bleeding for 12 years. The very fact that she had the tenacity, the wherewithal, the physical strength, the presence of mind to pull herself up from where she was to be where Jesus was, was a miracle in and of itself. Consider she is physically depleted due to the loss of blood. So she's moving about in a physically weakened condition. See, we like to make these people in the text, we, I like to humanize the people in the text. Because the truth is, have you ever been sick? Sick as a dog. Imagine yourself sick as a dog and now you got to get to Jesus. This is where this woman is. Consider mentally, she's been navigating this disease for over a decade and she has done the best that she could with managing this problem. It's mentally stressful to her to know that everywhere she goes, people declare unclean. I'm unclean. She's unclean. Look at her. You can imagine them snarling when she walks by. You can imagine them looking at her. I imagine she had begun to navigate life from the vantage point of this disease. But as we press in even more, here's the thing, what the text shows us. The text shows us that this problem was beyond the scope of her abilities. She couldn't do anything about it. She had done everything that she could possibly do. 
Now she needs God to do for her what she lacks the capacity to do for herself. She had tried managing it for years. I imagine that she knew when to go out for things, minimizing her, inter her interaction with people because knowing her, knowing her condition, people found her offensive. I, I imagine she, she knew how to be invisible, how to go in and go out and, and all of the things. Well, now she's at a place where she needs God to do for her what she can't do and she's re exhausted all of her resources. She needs God. Have you ever been there before? where you've tried everything that you know to do. You've exhausted all of your resources. Think about it. I've done everything that I can do to solve where I, I've done everything. I've prayed. I've cried. I've read my Bible. I've fasted. I've made declarations. I have scriptures up on my mirror. I'm praying. I'm fasting. I'm declaring the word of the Lord. I have my prayer group on it. I'm praying. I'm fasting. And nothing is getting better. It's still growing worse. And I'm praying. And I'm fasting. And now I need God to do for me what I don't have the capacity to do for myself. Is there anybody here today that has ever found yourself in a situation that was so wide and the situation was so vast and the situation was so above your ability that you say Lord if you don't do it then I don't know what's going to happen Lord if you don't perform a miracle then it simply won't be done Lord if you don't get involved I won't be able to stand this is where this woman is but it gets a little deeper y'all because as we press into the text not only do we see it's beyond her capacity, but we also see this, this problem exceeds the capacity of her environment. Th this problem exceeds the capacity of her environment. The text says in verse 26 that she had endured much suffering at the hands of many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but instead had become worse. This woman has a God-sized problem that requires God. But the next thing we see in the text is Jesus Christ revealed as the answer. Christ is revealed as the answer. God-sized problem, boom, here's the answer. Verse 27 of the text says, she had heard reports about Jesus and she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his outer robe. Can we talk about the power of our testimonies? Cause see, when we get to this part of the text, Oftentimes, people emphasize how she pressed her way and came up behind him in the, in the press. That's good, and that's appropriate. But, but, but I'll, today, I want to talk about what did she hear about Jesus? What, what, what did she hear about Jesus? And they, because th there were testimonies and reports circulating around him, about him, about his abilities, about this Jesus that obviously informed her faith to such a degree that she was willing to risk everything just to touch his outer robe. Can you imagine what she heard? And that's why we have to be very keen about the power of our testimonies. We don't know exactly what she heard. Perhaps she had heard about the recent uproar in the Gerasenes and him expelling the demon out of the man. And maybe that informed her faith. We don't know. Perhaps she had heard how he had healed many in the land, causing the lame to walk and causing the mute to talk. And she believed that this same Jesus could heal her. Perhaps she had heard of his miraculous turning water into wine and his healing with the man with the withered hand and she believed that the same Jesus could heal her maybe we don't know what she heard perhaps her, her understanding was more of a divine nature maybe she heard that this was the one had, that had been prophesied to restore the nation of Israel maybe she heard and maybe she had a divine revelation that this is the great I am wrapped up in flesh and dwelling among us maybe she had heard that wait a minute this this is the king eternal and the king immortal walking among us as Emmanuel. And maybe she said, I just need to touch him. Maybe she heard that he was the ancient of days, the one that was and is and is to come and walking among us. And she decided, I've got to touch him. We don't know what she heard, but whatever it is that she did hear, it informed her faith to such a degree that she said, if I can just touch his garment, I'll be made whole. Well, let me come down your road. Many of us are sitting on testimonies today and we are holding them to ourselves. But you know God to be a way maker. You know God to be a miracle worker. You have testimonies of God making ways out of no way. You have testimonies of God opening doors where
and there were no doors. I dare you to begin to declare your testimony and share it with somebody and watch your world change. Is there anybody here today that wants to give God praise just for your testimony? We don't know what she heard. We don't know who told her, but whatever it was, it shifted and changed her whole life. Whatever she heard was revolutionary enough that this woman said, I will break all protocol just to get to him. Can you imagine if we begin to declare what God has done in our life? Some of us are sitting on some world changing testimonies. Now I'm not saying tell everybody your business, but what I am saying, if God has been good to you, scripture declares, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You ought to be declaring what God has done in your life. You ought to be declaring he healed my body. You ought to be declaring he made a way when I couldn't see one. You ought to be declaring he broke the shackles of bondage off of me. You ought to be declaring he is the one that made ways when everybody else counted me out. You ought to be the one to say that he gave me influence in a context where I didn't even qualify. You ought to be the one declaring that he caused me to walk in credibility that I know I don't deserve. Is there anybody in here today that wants to give God? She heard a testimony. She heard a testimony. So, God-sized problems require God. Christ is revealed as the solution. She sees beyond her current circumstance. And now, we get to the total deliverance. Total deliverance. The text says, immediately her flow of blood was dried up. And she felt in her body and knew without any doubt that she was healed of her suffering immediately. Jesus, recognizing in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in around you from all sides, and you ask, who touched me? Still, he kept looking around to see the woman who had done it, and the woman, though she was afraid and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith, your personal trust and confidence in me has restored you to health. Go in peace and be permanently healed from your suffering. Now listen, the obvious deliverance here is the issue of her blood. The hemorrhaging is resolved. That's the obvious deliverance. Scripture affirms that immediately her flow of blood dried up. And on a surface level, I surmise that that's the deliverance that she sought. But let's go deeper. But because God does all things well, there was more than just physical deliverance render it, rendered in this moment for this woman. See, in addition to her physical healing, he delivered her from dependence on man. When, when, when Jesus said, who touched me, it's been widely debated as to if he knew. We're not going to debate that today. What I'm identifying is this woman who was ceremonial, ceremonially unclean touched him who had been treated like she had been treated like a social pariah he does not rebuke her he does not shun her he does not ask her why she touched him instead he affirms her by calling her daughter let's just sit right there he called her daughter the one who had been rejected daughter the one who had been shunned daughter the one who had been rejected daughter the one who had been declared unclean daughter the one who had been looked over daughter he called her daughter which speaks to what royalty it speaks to what an inheritance it speaks to what immutable relationship it speaks to what there is nothing that can separate her and him because she's forever a daughter i don't care what they called you i don't care what you've been answering to i want you to look in the mirror and then dig in to declare i'm a son of god i'm a daughter of god why because he knows your name and he calls you daughter he calls you son but let's go further let's go further he delivers her from her dependence on man he says your personal trust and confidence in me has restored you to hell 
I submit to you today that that's the greatest deliverance. The deliverance is this. She had depended on man to do for her what only God could do. But now she has faith that's locked on to the one that can do something. And I imagine that it realigned her entire paradigm. Whereas before she was like, listen, I need man to do this and I need y'all to do that. Now she says, listen, me and God are the majority. As long as I've got him, I'm good. And there's something about when you find out that all you really need is Jesus. Listen, we were created for community, but in certain situations, you need God to do for you what only he can do for you and that's the deliverance right there that when you recognize that as long as I got God I'm good as long as I got the one with all the infinite power I'm good as long as I have the one who is infinite in power I'm good as long as he calls me his son or daughter I'm good is there anybody in here today that will give God a praise that he calls you son that he calls you daughter and all you need is him God. Wow. We told him, we tried to tell him. Tried to tell him, just that you just don't know who's gonna be on, and we're surprising you week after week. That's why you gotta watch week after week. You just never, ever know. And we pray that the word of the Lord has been such a blessing to you. There's a number on the screen right now. We have operators and teams on standby. They're willing and ready to pray with you. But what I wanna do right now, Pastor Maxwell, will you lead the people in prayer just believing God that something marvelous is gonna happen? Absolutely, let's look to the Lord even now. Lord, we thank you for the seed of your word that we have heard today, God. We ask that it would have transformational impact in the lives of the hearers today, God. Your word declares that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. We thank you even now that minds have been changed, souls yes. have been renewed, and a new thing is on the horizon. Lord, we thank you for all of these things, and we give you honor and praise. It's in the eternal name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray, amen, amen. and amen. Amen, Listen, we're all out of talk. Well, maybe not out of talk. But we are out of time. So until this time next week, you keep it locked right here. And as I always say, in the meantime and in between time, do everything in your power to make it a greater change. <laughs> and we'll see you next week. Peace. Next week on Greater Change Ministries. But I could hear the Lord say, I know you may not understand right now, but I got this. I dare you to look at somebody and say, ah, I got this. That's, that's what the Lord is saying. Just the moment you feel as though that you can't get to the next level. If you hear God's voice, he said, I got this. And what did God do almost 30 days ago? He flipped the script. Why don't you look at somebody tell them you can't play with God. You can't, you cannot play with God. He is too real. You can't play with God.